Welcome. Welcome to another installation of the Danley Sound Labs Fireside Chats. I'm Josh Millward, product specialist at Danley Sound Labs, and I'm your host for this series. Be sure to keep your mic muted and your camera off to help conserve bandwidth for those who are on a slow connection. This week, Mike Hedden is joining us. He'll be talking with us about innovation, the path less traveled. After Mike's presentation, we'll be taking questions and talking about them. Please use the chat feature at any time to send me your questions. I'll ask the questions to Mike when we get to that part of the presentation. Before we get started, I just want to take a minute to remind everyone that the previous episodes of Fireside Chats are available on the Danley Sound Labs YouTube channel. We always try to get them up as quickly as possible, but please allow us a week to get them posted. Um, I believe we just posted the um, the one from last week, this morning, so it should be up there. With that, let me find Mike in the list here. And all these people showing up, it's making it difficult to uh, <laughs> to make Mike the presenter. So let me hit make presenter. And OK, Mike, why don't you right, go ahead and take away. it away? OK, so you can hear me now, eh? Yep, sounded good. Very well. Um, Okay, so thank you all, first of all, for uh, joining us. Uh, it means a lot that you, the most valuable thing you got is time, and you give us some of that. Uh, can you see my screen okay there, Josh? Let me go full screen. With yeah, the we can see your show. screen, Mike. All right, and the go to meeting stuff is out of the way for you guys, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, they got these yeah we're pads. seeing it in a window here, so we can see your whole screen. All right, so do I just reduce that? Hey, all nope, right. you don't have to do anything for us. We're good. Okay, cool. All right, so, um, hey, wait a minute. I'm already running into a little technical difficulty because it's jumped to the wrong <laughs> slide. Hang on one second. Uh, all right, you're seeing the entire presentation. Start at the beginning. Um, when we were talking about what what as a topic, uh, I came up with this a little walk down memory lane of the Danley Zoo. Um, I, I usually come up with the goofy names of the products. Uh, sometimes they're, they're 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 meant to be internal, and then they turn out to be the product name that you know sticks. So um, uh, if nothing else, hopefully we're having a little fun. So when um, when we started the, um, uh, the the question was shark fin and uh, what are we going to do next with shark fin and I said well we really ought to give everybody a sense of context so that, just real quickly the, there's a handful of slides here but I'll I'll, I'll blow through them uh, you've seen this slide before this is the inverse square which is the law I mean it's not a suggestion it's the one that everybody I don't care what they make is going to bow the knee to um, and um, and it's something that we encounter every time we try to do audio over or anything. So here's, you know, a, a simple, you've seen this in the past presentation. Here's a simple 30 foot high low Q device. And you have a 12 dB reduction to the 160 foot path uh, versus the uh, 40 foot path. Um, and um, here's the synergy horn equal loudness balloon, you know, aiming the, the zero axis to the back wall this is nothing new to any good synod con um, and this is where we get the concept of throwing the top half of the horn away um, and if you take um, uh, anybody's modeling software and you say hey I've got a 90 by 40 horn so take the 40 take that zero axis and put the zero right there and go minus 20 minus 20 and you you know you get the hot spot in the middle and it's down on the uh, uh, front and back. So these are issues that this here's the idealized uh, uh, approach, which would be this uh, stigmatized, as it were, shaded amplitude horn, where the top half of the balloon is 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 wrapped into the to the lower section. Um, and until Tom came up with this, some of these crazy ideas, I'd never seen this actually done before. Um, so. We kicked this around several years ago, the whole concept of 
I came up with the the uh, uh, idea of SALT, shaded amplitude lens technology. And the idea was uh, if you uh, had the proper bending angles and it all goes back to quarter wavelength spacing and whatnot in these lenses, um, uh, it all starts with a synergy horn and then how do we spread that energy over this, um, so we're in, essentially inverting that previous slide that showed the minus 12 at the back, okay? So we're putting the zero at the furthest seat. Um, could this be done? Well, so the first, this is a little history for you. We had a glass atrium at a large church that needed a, an area. It was really kind of goofy. It's a big fan shape. The, the auditorium seats about 3,000 people. Uh, the foyer was a big wraparound foyer with a, 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 a 50 foot clear span to the deck, literally nothing to really fly off of. Um, and if you could fly it, it would be a real uh, pain to get a lift up there to, uh, to do any kind of servicing. So we decided, um, hey, uh, maybe we could use this lens technology that Tom's been kicking around. The funny thing was it, um, it didn't exist at the time. So Tom brings me this example and, and uh, hang on one second. Tom brings me a, um, uh, a, an unfinished birch box and the concept of porcupine was that on the side of the box, he had actually traced out his pattern and it looked kind of like the side of a porcupine or a hedgehog. So there's, there's where the name came from. Um, as I say in the slide, sadly, no pictures exist of this either in captivity or the wild. Um, I need to go over to that church sometime and, and just tell them I'll, I'll, I'll pay you some uh, handsome, handsome ransom to, to uh, just put it in a, a museum. Um, it's essentially a two by two. It would fit in a two by two ceiling grid. Um, it hangs down about five inches below the trim height. It's mounted at about 10 or 12 feet, probably 10, 12 feet. Yeah up in the air um, and it's covering a distance out to about 130, 150, uh, about 120 feet, excuse me, um, which would be effectively the vertical of the horn. But yet because it's a, a curved glass on one uh, area and then they have offices or, or kind of breakout rooms on the other side, they didn't want any energy going into those areas and they certainly didn't want to energize that that big glass atrium that, that was a, a you know going to have focusing problems. Um, so this sucker has a uh, has a pattern such that if you stood in the middle of it, you're on the zero axis. If you take one good step out left or right, so you know two feet to the left, two feet to the right of this uh, 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 little porcupine, and um, and you're like 10 dB down. I mean it's crazy. I demoed it for people over the years and they'd be like, uh, dude, it, I got to tell you, I'm not very impressed. I said, well, you're out of the horn. Well, no, I'm not. And I said, well, half a step over and then all of a sudden, boom. So I, I don't have a picture of it, but I do have measurements of it. So here is the porcupine outside. This is off the back dock at the old uh, shop there. And you can see it was good to, oh, roughly 125 Hertz. Now this is a little goofy because, um, uh, uh, if I remember right, I was uh, I wasn't in a boundary position, uh, so you're going to see some reflections in in the measurement. But the the kicker here is just look at this minus six as kind of being your your uh, your zero line. So here we are at ten feet, and um, uh, then we'll go to twenty feet. There's a nice notch in the response that came from a reflection, but notice that minus six line okay so now we've just doubled the distance and we're actually at the same level now we're going to go to 40 feet and again inverse square says we ought to be 60 be down we're at the same level at 40 feet then we go out to 80 feet and you can see where now we're going to tail off down here because the box isn't big enough to to maintain as much pattern control but it's still very respectable to have gone from 10 feet or 20 feet to 80 feet I think the last one I've got is 130 feet. Um, so at 130 feet, if that's your minus six, then yeah, we're 12 dB down at eight kilohertz. But it, but down in here, it's kind of amazing for this two by two ceiling speaker. And then you also see the beauty of the Synergy Horn, how it uniformly is rolling off, not just losing pattern at some HF. So that was the first one. 
Um, uh, and here's just a comparison between 20 versus 80. So it make it easy on you if you're looking at that upper area. Um, if take that notch out of the response, which was a reflection. Like I said, there's the mine. There's that that line, and here's that line, and we're going from 20 feet to 80 feet. So it's it, it works, right? Um, well, along came Turner Field, which was the home at that time of the Atlanta Braves. And actually, when I was seeing these pictures the other day, I I had a little. It made me a little sad because this was a this was the first major stadium we ever I think ever did. Uh, this was a giant. This was the former uh, Olympic Stadium for 1996, um, and then they converted it to baseball. It was uh, one of the largest uh, in all of Major League Baseball as far as seating capacity. Um, and um, and so here's a little background. Um, the lower deck, uh, the lower seating down here, um, uh, from if you can see my cursor, from these seats to this seat, that's about 110 feet or so. And um, the existing system, I have notes um, here. The old system was falling apart, uh, literally. I mean, I could put my finger through the cabinets. Um, um, and after removing the old system, the new proposed systems, uh, the specified manufacturer had just shifted all their manufacturing offshore conveniently for their bottom line, uh, screwing the contractor. And um, the contractor in total desperation, because literally the only time they were gonna be able to get product was about two months after baseball season had started, which uh, for those of you playing at home, that's usually not something that uh, Major League Baseball is going to want to do, is tell you to move all your home games away. Uh, the, the, the county that the, the stadium is located in had already threatened lawsuits because of what they had heard. So we get this Princess Leia, Danley, you're our only hope. Um, it was not a hologram uh, out of a little robot, but, um, uh, but it was just as uh, desperate. Um, now, so we go down there, we mocked up a quick demo for them with some existing product. And the, uh, uh, the one of the very specific uh, complaints was right here. Uh, the ball players hated the chaos when the system that was installed was played because what it was was basically uh, two stacked loudspeakers, one aimed at the far seats, one aimed, you know, short throw, long throw, driven with different amp channels. And the problem was that just like we showed in that early uh, 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 loudness bubble, um, it's just minus six going out to the far seats. Um, so when you have hundreds of boxes aimed out there, it sounds like absolute chaos. So we got the order and we delivered, and I'm real proud of this. We did 430 boxes in six weeks from the date of the order. This was during Christmas, by the way. Um, and uh, of that, 360 of them did not exist, um, including 33 of these, which we dubbed the birdhouse. And here is the birdhouse. Um, it's the shaded amplitude lens. This is like a higher powered version of the hedgehog, okay, or the porcupine. And here it is in uh, real. So there you go. Uh, these guys here. And they, this is back towards home plate. Um, these, the seats back in here were covered with SH-25s from about 300 feet away, which was an amazing experience. Um, and there were 33 of these. Now, when you stood between the pattern of this guy and this guy, you can't see it from this perspective, but it's, a, it's covering a lot of area. Um, when you stood between the two, you actually got a phantom center channel, like there was another loudspeaker in the middle, which... Uh, many folks, including some very, rather noted consultants, uh, when they visited Turner Field said, good Lord, I've never heard anything like this. Uh, I actually have a picture of Tom Holman of the THX uh, experience um, uh, visiting this. And he said, you know, I'm standing here listening to an empty 50 some odd thousand seat stadium listening uh, while I'm visiting the CDS show. And I'm hearing audio that sounds better than most everything I'm hearing at the CDS show. <laughs> so, um, we were real proud of that, but it's 110 feet. Now, um, SALT, the shaded amplitude lens technology, applies, e applies even coverage from the top to the bottom. And here is um, a little more close up. We color matched um, uh, the green ones. Um, uh, we wanted to, we kicked around the idea of making these tomahawks. 
Of course, after we called it the birdhouse, we immediately got told by Fulton County, who's the uh, owner, owner, uh, the government, uh, the county, um, that uh, they they don't want pigeons anywhere around, so they didn't like our reference to a birdhouse. Um, the chaos that uh, the bay ball players uh, complained about with the previous system, which honestly is what everybody to this day, if you're using somebody's constant directivity horn and you and you take a a long throw quote unquote box up here and a one below it and you aim that zero axis out there um, you're going to spray all kinds of energy out into the field um, uh, when you took a step off of this um, from the uh, onto the playing field when you got off the warning track which is the dirt area when you got onto the actual playing field you were 10 db down versus the last seat um, so the players actually did not even hardly hear the system. It was remarkable. So, uh, so we've gone from a porcupine hedgehog to a, a birdhouse. Uh, then we get to the next thing was Genesis horn, which also used the, the shaded amplitude lens uh, technology. And um, I'll blow through these real quick. This is a three wide cluster. Um, it's not an animal. It's just it's the next thing in the in the uh, evolution, as it were, of what we were doing. And in this, I'm going to rotate that up, and you'll see a red area that shows you the. Uh, this is the back of the Genesis horn, just showing you how cool the um, the driver of the engine is with that paraline lens and uh, all the all things synergistic with it. So here is the paraline lens without the veins. Okay, so then we add. So you'll see there's more area covered here. And then I'm going to tilt these boxes essentially up. So you, we're, it's like we're below the box looking up at it. So you're going to see progressively less red. All right. And we're going to go like we're walking underneath it, less red. And then a tiny a bit of red. Okay. And then just because I think it looks a great, it's a cool picture. Here is the boxes without the cabinet. I think that's got to be some kind of uh, gorgeous artwork. Uh, uh, with the veins. Now, uh, to prove uh, to prove uh, how well the the uh, Genesis horn actually did it, we had a local uh, friend that had this. Uh, I think this is an SLS uh, line array, um, and I picked the SLS because it's all ribbons and they're all vertically stacked in the proper orientation. So this should be kind of as good as it could be. And we took a local big parking lot and we we literally did polars horizontal and vertical uh, on the array and the single box. And here's that compilation. So this uh, we went from 30 feet to 150 feet. And you'll see um, uh, on axis, uh, this is the loudspeaker. This is the eight uh, line arrays and this is 10 dB per division. OK. Uh, both these scales are the same and you can see especially when you get out here in the two kilohertz range um you know we're in the that's 10 20 we're in a 30 db window above 2k um down here we take a single genesis horn um doing the same distance 30 to 150 feet you'll see that we stay within a, a tighter window um it's actually a quite a bit better overall response um, and, um, and it was just a, you know, this was one amplifier channel driving a passive GH60. It's why at Lambeau Field, I still get Christmas cards from them saying how wonderful they love Lambeau Field or Buffalo Bills. Or, uh, if you hear a pregame at uh, Alabama at Bryant Denny, you're listening to a Genesis horn. So the Genesis horn has been a, a fascinating success for us. Um, here's the advantages. Um, uh, it's a beautiful thing. But so that leads us to the shark fin, um, um, because honestly, with the Genesis horn, uh, one of the things you run into is um, th there's a practical side to uh, putting those louvers in there and getting them spaced properly. And, and uh, I mean, there's there's some logistical stuff involved. So. Oh, about two years ago, I got asked to go. There's a major video uh, LED uh, manufacturer in the Atlanta area, and they wanted to talk to us about possibly incorporating some of our concepts into their displays as they get into big corporate uh, deals. And as I'm talking to them, um, they came back 
I said, well, where can I put loudspeakers? And, and, and the joke was when I got back talking to Tom, I said, Tom, it sounds like all we have is the bezel. <laughs> you know, we have the width of the side of that thing is where we can put sound. And I'm talking, you know, two, three inches. And so I just sort of, as a joke said, so there you go, Tom, you know, knock yourself out. Now we could make it curved. We could, we could bend the energy back and put the, the, the engine behind the display. But as far as what they want to see, it's tiny little sliver. And, uh, Tom shows up a few weeks later with, uh, with the shark fin. Now the original shark fin was just this, this, this tiny little sliver, and it would go down to about 150, maybe 200 Hertz, but it shaded the amplitude. So it's louder up here and, and, uh, quieter down here. Um, and, um, and it was the widest thing that I have ever heard. And I, I've been in the audio business for 30 years and I've heard a lot of loudspeakers in my life. And I was like, oh my gosh. So we, we had a pair of them there and I, and I just had never heard stereo this wide. Um, so, you know, we do what we always do. I said, well, let's make it, uh, let's go lower. Let's make it more broadband. So that's where this box came from. Um, uh, it's a pair of eights and that, that, uh, uh, that, driver config that Tom came up with. And um, I know Ian has posted some things. We've actually, there's a, there's a magazine doing a review in France on the shark fin uh, currently. Um, if you don't, if you haven't heard of shark fin, it is a, it is a, it's an amazing thing. The beauty of this design is we get the, the amplitude shading without having to do the louvers and stuff. And um it's much, much wider than anything that I have ever seen before. Here's a polar um, of, um, here's the horizontal. And I noticed on one of the posts on one of the social media, somebody said, well, hey, at what frequency is, uh, is it 180 degrees? Well, this is two kilohertz and there's 90 and there's 270 or 90 off the other way. And you can see it's pretty darn close to 180 degrees at uh, two kilohertz. It narrows up a little bit above that. But still overall, now that right there is 16 kilohertz. So in, in uh, you know, for those of you that are paying attention, indeed, it's a little beamy, but good Lord, that's at 16 kilohertz. That's a 16, yeah, way up there. Some of y'all can't even hear that. Um, also, it shows the uh, the uh, the down tilt. Uh, the This was the, when it was measured. It was measured with the... Uh, um, basically you can see the uh, amplitude shading in the in the in the vertical um it's a remarkable loudspeaker and it still has quite a bit of forward directivity um and there will be more versions uh kyle marriott had mentioned uh you know the uh the idea of having a genesis or excuse me a jericho horn with uh, some type of shark which we would call the megalodon i guess and then we could have the great white and we could have the hammerhead and whatever but um, um, the, the fact is, yeah, we can do that and we will do that. Um, uh, 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 oops, I don't want to leave the meeting. No. Um, so what's next? Um, there's a bunch of new technologies that we really do believe are going to make you smile or make you cry, depending on which side of the team you're on. If you're with us, you're going to be grinning like a mule eating briars or a possum eating persimmons or whatever your you know, pick your uh, favorite animal. Um, if you're on the other side and you're my competitor, you're going to be crying because we are going to light you up. Um, and, um, and I'm going to do it in a way that I wish you well. Uh, certainly we have a lot of uh, tragic situations with the, the world that we find ourselves in, but we at Danley are extremely energized uh, technology innovation has never been more needed. And all I can tell you is this Tom Danley is as geeked as I have ever seen him. Um, and we are, so just stay tuned. There's going to be, we're going to develop. And, and what's cool is, is all this stuff goes back to a uh, synergy horn. I mean, go back to any of my competitors and tell them uh, and look at them and say, 15 years ago, what you made 15 years ago, is that still your core? And I'm telling you, a lot of my manufacturers don't know what they made 15 years ago. Um, and yet it is still our core. It still will be our core because that's that's part of the brilliant idea of, of uh, the genius of Brother Tom. And with that, 
I think I'm done. So I give it back to you there, uh, Mr. Millward. All right, very good. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I just love the uh, the history behind some of this stuff because uh, you know there's a few things like the the porcupine and the the birdhouse that you know if if someone hasn't um, hasn't been paying attention to Danley for for a number of years they probably haven't heard of these things. So it's a it's a good idea to point out that uh, you know Danley does have quite a good history of of making unique unique things in the uh, in the industry. So and and specifically things that solve really unique problems uh, because you know certainly you know as as we all know uh, all aspects of audio are basically you know pick picking a you know the fight you can win versus fighting everything because uh, everything's a compromise pretty much so uh, so you got to pick what you can what you can do and what you can't do and and these. Uh, all of these have offered really unique solutions to unique problems. So, so yeah. All right. Well, um, haven't gotten any questions in from anybody yet, but uh, um, but I'd be happy to uh, happy to take any if anyone's got any that they would like to talk to Mike about. Um, oh, so Cooper just popped in here about uh, giving the world. What's this now? The details to the Genesis horn, or give more real-world details to the Genesis horn, such as the measured response throughout the stands and the drop-off in the field for the players at Turner Field. Well, uh, that would have been the birdhouse. The birdhouse was um, um, it was working in conjunction with the rest of the system. Now, the, one of the things about Major League Baseball, at least uh, in the States, uh, which I guess is the only place that they have Major League Baseball, um, they tend to be a bit wimpy on the base, um, uh, which is frustrating to us. Um, uh, but um, the, uh, the system there was primarily uh, highly adapted uh, SH-95s with SH-25s, SH-46s, and then um, those birdhouses. So we were good to about 80 or 90 hertz. Um, and um, uh, uh, so the, they, but everything worked in conjunction with everything else. So the birdhouse was, was actually, um, um, yeah, we, we were good from about 100 or so down or up rather. And um, there you have it. Yeah, Ivan was mentioning here that the, uh, the birdhouse was specifically designed for a specific seating area. And during the tuning, we ran into one section that was different in level. We then realized that that particular section was a different size and nobody had realized it during the design. It's, everything still worked out okay, but that, that one part's just a little bit different. Yeah, and the funny thing was, uh, the, the fix was I brought one of those birdhouses back and I literally took, um, we had to acoustically attenuate, so we we uh, we took uh, essentially foam from a like a um, uh, air conditioning uh, 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 filters and um, and played with stuffing those lenses and uh, measured it and and came up with the assessment and we so we passively EQ'd them <laughs> using uh, foam. <laughs> passively EQ'd, nice. Um, so I got a, a, uh, another note here from Skip. He mentioned that, uh, he measured one dB of variation at Buffalo in the upper bowl, uh, apparently using, uh, the GH sixties up there. And, uh, and oddly it was one dB hotter at the seat closest to the balcony, um, rather than at the top. I assume I'm not totally familiar with that, but I assume that the, that there the uh the loudspeakers are above the back yeah exactly the they're up on they're up on top of um i actually designed that system and i designed the system at uh, lambo um uh the um uh yeah they're 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 shooting behind the people down uh there's four big towers at uh at uh buffalo and um Gosh, I think the majority of that is only what is that? Skip twelve, I think. There's three per section, maybe. So it's not there's not a lot of loudspeakers to cover eighty something thousand people. That's correct. Wow. 
So, so yeah, but but interesting that it's actually a little louder further away than it is uh, than it is up closer. Hey, um, and uh, I see one. Excuse me, I see one from Rocky yeah. about the would there be more Genesis horns planned? The answer is there certainly can be, um, because. Um, um, Honestly, the original Genesis horn, uh, the idea behind it was we were going to actually have two separate dr driven sections. So you'd have a short throw, long throw. So even though you got the shading amplitude, you could have even further control down low and have kind of a, a separate downfield that would just be driven off a different amp channel. Um, so the answer is, yeah, we could make more uh, versions of that. And um, and. Every time I hear a Genesis horn, I just smile. I mean, we really don't hardly make anything that I don't smile about, but it's like, um, gosh, what a great loudspeaker. Right. So Trooper had asked here, is the shark fin passive or bi -amped? It's passive right now, yeah. Yeah. Um, So there's some a question here about uh, ceiling speakers from Scott. Um, he says that that ceiling speaker or that ceiling style speaker in the church sounds really interesting. Are there any plans to expand on that on on that for things like corporate boardrooms and meeting rooms? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, maybe for the few that saw it but we we made a thing that um year or this was about three four years ago at vegas we did it uh, looked a bit like a witch's hat although most people couldn't see it because it was above the ceiling tile but um the idea being um if you're standing underneath it you're in the coverage you take one step forward away from it like towards where a display might be and you're in the minus 10. if you take a step left or right literally a full step so it's basically the same kind of weird horizontal that we were getting out of the porcupine um you're in the minus 10 but if you walk straight back it took you 10 meters so you had to go 30 feet to get to the minus 10 and um um you know it's that that way for kiosks for uh, uh museums where you want to have a display because anybody who's ever seen you know the dakota audio or the the you know the little dome uh, thingies with the focusing uh, the problem with that is, is it's such a small cone, people can't stay all that. Uh, yeah, there's just not a lot of people that can enjoy it. Um, um, and now we're living in the social distancing world. But um, uh, the uh, this would allow us to cover a greater area and still maintain massive amounts of pattern control. So short answer is, um, yeah, Scott, we are going to uh, do more with that. All right, and Rocky also asked about uh, uh, is there GLL or SPK files for the shark fin? That can be had? Uh, should be, yeah. Um, I know it's in it's in the direct. I'll I'll talk to uh, Sebastian, um, but it should be that uh, we yes, the shark fin is there, um, and th there will there will be more. Uh, there's no doubt. There's more shark fins coming higher powered versions. Uh, we don't need to go any wider. I don't think 180 is all we need. Um, uh, the uh, the SoundSphere guys get, might get mad at me. <laughs> Terrible joke, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, um, um, how low can you go on your queue? Um, the, uh, it, but it is a, uh, yeah, it's coming. So yeah, speaking to that, Ian just uh, just asked here. A larger shark fin was theoretically discussed. Could we expect an SH ninety six of J three driver count sized ones? Uh, the beauty of it is, Ian, because of the fact that it, again, going back to the, the that integral in, uh, synergy engine, is uh, we really can make it. There's a lot of ways it can go. Now there's uh, uh, there's always going to be whether it's Hoffman's Iron Law or whatever. There's there's stipulations where you go, okay, this is as far as we can take it without physically getting really really big. But um, uh, absolutely, I think uh, something that's got significantly more output. Um, the 
the first one that we made that that we that we played at the show that some people that that this uh, French magazine is reviewing was done in in um, uh, you know Tom did one and then I said good lord the world needs to hear this because uh, it sounded so good but um, um, but that was just the start and it's by no means the finish. So yeah, even. Uh, Ian just mentioned uh, even SPL with no DSP would be a huge game changer. Um, totally understand. Yeah, because, you know, so many of the, the line array solutions that are typically uh, promoted in those in those situations have just a, a ton of DSP. So, yeah. And I see Rocky's question about the immersive audio. The short answer is yes. Um, um, one of the, uh, he, the question is, have we done any immersive type systems uh, a la Lisa Soundscape, uh, the stuff that uh, L Acoustics or uh, DMB, you could also throw what Myers trying, has done with uh, the LCS product, the VRAS and whatnot, uh, and ma the Matrix 3 engine. Uh, I've owned a Matrix 3 for about 25 years. So uh, to say that I have an appreciation for immersive audio is, uh, uh, is a is an understatement. Twenty uh, something years ago, I spent fifty some odd grand to to be uh, the Matrix Three guy for the southeastern United States. So yeah, I know a little bit about immersive audio. Um, I've got Dr. Paletti's uh, doctoral thesis on on the subject sitting on a uh, on my uh, counter, um, and we are working with. Uh, 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 I don't think it'd be. Uh, wrong um steve barber with uh acoustics some of you would know him as layers uh he's the biggest player in that world times i mean you can take every immersive audio system out there and uh, multiply it times three or four and steve has more than all of those combined um and um so yeah we're, we're we are actively working with steve um it's a very heady type of a product it's not something that as bad as everybody wants it to be, it's going to be the next everything. It's not ever going to be the next everything because it's, it, uh, it takes so much to implement it properly. But we are definitely working on, um, we, as I've said from the beginning, we will never be a me too. Um, I do find it fascinating the number of loudspeaker manufacturers, two of them are listed here in Rocky's uh, question, that are talking about um, immersive audio. And yet, when you actually dig into the engines of what they're doing, they're essentially just taking left-right information and spraying it around. Uh, there's no real true um, discrete paths. Um, and um, uh, what what Steve is able to do in the layer system um, allows you to really get there. So, um, yeah. Uh, you know, heck, we did a, I did a layers demo, uh, what was it, three, four years ago in Vegas, actually played my horn, did the whole thing. Right. That was, uh, that was uh, along with the introduction of the nanos, right? Because we had a whole bunch of nanos all yes, over sir. the ceiling, right? You are correct. Yeah. Very cool. So, yeah, we've been around that a little bit. So, yeah, and, and like, and to your point, Mike, uh, immersive audio is nothing new. Um, you know, yes, uh, some of these companies have some new twists on it, but, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff has been around conceptually, at least, for, for quite a while with uh, varying degrees of implementation. Oh, absolutely. And and I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, down on the idea. Like I said, I, good gosh, I, I mean, I had the, well, we had the you, only. You invested heavily in it. We, you we invested had the, heavily in it a long yeah. time ago. <laughs> I mean, literally, uh, the, 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 when I called Steve Ellison to tell him that, hey, dude, I figured out how to get get us a ceiling speaker for the VRAS rig. And the, literally the day I called him to tell him that, he had t he told me sort of sheepishly, he said, well, it, uh, it looks like Meyer's going to acquire us. And I was like, oh, great. Well, good for you. You know I mean? Um, because we had been fighting to come up with something that was well-behaved low Q that had forward directivity. And, um, um, so, um, yeah, I'm, so I really believe in it. Um, and I love seeing being able to make people localize. I just think that it's fascinating that so far the, uh, 
some of the attempts are using things that have got such incredible time smear in their in their in their essence and you're trying to get people to have this immersive audio experience in this massive smear so you bring something that truly has a uh, an accurate phase signature uh, you will put them in another realm and with that i've put everybody to sleep <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so. I was just uh, reading Rocky's uh, uh, comment here about unlike VRAS, which he specified and commissioned before, newer systems provide for image localization across multiple channels of a soundstage. I think the shark fin is a natural for this in lower cost applications. Yeah, and that's a great point. Um, some of the new technology, massive, massive tease that none of you have ever heard um, that's coming uh, is going to allow us to do some things. Uh, again, inverse square is something that everybody's got to live with, but I don't see many manufacturers dealing with it, uh, not not effectively. So um, look at an Atmos system in a in a in a uh, a uh, commercial cinema. Um, you know, you got these progressively larger theaters that uh, the wider they get to accomplish the, the, the giant screen or to accommodate the giant screen, the downside is those surrounds, those lateral surrounds are progressively further and further and further away from the people in the middle. Now you can say, oh yeah, but you know, you don't know what you're talking about. They got a hundred channels in the Atmos. Well, maybe they got stuff overhead, but the lateral cues that you have to have to get proper localization those boundaries are still the long way away from you. So the way you solve part of that issue is it's through shade the amplitude so that the person sitting right at the loudspeaker is in the minus 10, but the person who's out there, you know, 75 feet away is in the zero. And I just showed you a slide that shows we've already done it uh, with a two by two. Um, so um, um, yeah, we think that's where the future really goes. Right, right. Do uh, you see this question from Ian here about uh, any idea? The mouse down know? there. Yeah, yeah actually, at, at, uh, at risk, we we don't we obviously don't want to throw you under the bus and have the mouse uh, head hunting you or anything. But uh, ah, the mouse is they furloughed a hundred thousand people. Of course, that means they got a hundred thousand headhunters. I guess I could look at it that way. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I ain't got nothing else to do. Let's go kill that boy. But the um, um, what they're actually doing there, uh, Ian, is um, mixing uh, uh, streams in the in in, in uh, Qsys, and then they have uh, it's actually quite um, um, there's no big fancy matrix. It's actually um, to the chagrin of some of the engineers because we have talked extensively about what we could do with that system. Uh, they want to do concerts and in, a, in a, like immersive stuff there, but um, right now it's actually not kind of non-sexy stuff. The first, um, the first few things we did with the surround system at Star Wars, um, we could not get Disney to give us discrete paths. We actually had our own, which was insane. Here I am at Disney, and we're the guys supplying the content. <laughs> it was crazy. So are they doing, is it mostly just basic uh, multi-channel playback or? Yeah, it's, they, they, they finally got, uh, if you've heard it in the last year or so, um, they finally got Lucasfilm, of course, Disney now owns, um, um, uh, Dis, uh, Disney owns uh, Star Wars or whatever. They finally got access to the, to the uh, discrete stream channels and strings, they call it and um and have have uh, broken stuff because at one point it was almost like just a hodgepodge of lr oh almost like a uh, uh dolby pro logic decoding kind of thing <laughs> yeah yeah hey put it on you know everybody yeah <laughs> um so scott here mentions about if they're using qsys they're probably using DCIO-H, which takes an HDMI audio input and breaks it out into discrete uh, digital streams. Oh, that's a yeah. sounds like a cool little little device there. 
yeah, the kicker was that it just took them a while to get them. They, uh, that system, uh, kind of forced them to have to go back in and remix some stuff. Um, which was very, very cool. Matter of fact, I was there, uh, Ian may have been there for that one. We had the, the mastering engineer, uh, when that premiered was right in front of me. And, um, um, cause they had, they had literally remixed the entire thing for that system. Oh, wow. So, uh, Rocky's got another question here, um, about powered products. Uh, any thoughts of building powered products with the, our OEM amp suppliers? Uh, yeah, um, we, um, of course, the Studio 2 is that way now. Um, and um, um, so I guess the short answer is yes, uh, we are... Um, We've kind of, you know, at one point we offered almost everything in a self-powered version. We're using Brian Opgard's amps. Um, Brian has sold that company and moved on and to other ventures, and we wish him very, very well. Um, but um, we do have another, we've got another technical breakthrough that uh, is going to, uh, that we will have to incorporate. Uh, there's a nice big tease. So the answer is, yeah, there's going to be some self-powered stuff coming. But we're probably not going to be doing uh, like the whole line available and powered. No, nah, uh, like I mean, it, like it was in that. the past. Exactly, we tried that, and we honestly, uh, uh, it was difficult to keep. Um, uh, we were using a U.S. manufacturer of amplifiers, and uh, it was uh, it was sometimes tough to justify the cost, you know, difference. Right. So Todd asks, is the amplitude shading of shark fin accomplished with the shape of the horn mouth, or is there something else going on in there? It's a combination. It's the shape, it's the uh, it's that slot, uh, but it's also the path length of the horn. So if you remember like the old um the old clip horns, right? Uh uh typically um you'd look up and see this fairly small mouth mid-range, and you go, well, how can that thing have any any uh it wasn't shading the amplitude but it had directivity um uh they got that because of the length of the horn so this is a combination of the path length that's wrapping inside of the box that you don't see as well as that slot that we essentially um distribute the energy through all right good deal So Todd also mentions here, back in the day, Alltech made a large format horn with a similar looking slot. Hey man, uh, they called it the very intense. I have my old, uh, Claiborne Sharp was on here. Um, uh, still is hopefully. Hey Claiborne. Uh, I've got my uh, slide rule. Um, for those of you uh, that are too young to know, that was a calculator that was made out of cardboard. <laughs> and uh the um uh the difference is uh first of all um as as uh, someone wisely said years ago i don't know if it's don davis or or dick heiser or whatever but you know um the ancients keep just stealing our discoveries or if we're if we're standing tall it's because we're standing on the shoulders of giants um uh ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun so um um you know what we are what, here's what we're doing different that Alltech nor anybody else did because uh, JBL had one, um, uh, uh, several folks, uh, EV had one as well. Um, all of that was very much confined just to the HF bandwidth. So, you know, you had to get up above, say, eh, two kilohertz for it to actually be working. We're able to do uh, what we're doing to a much lower uh, uh, frequency, and it's all because of synergy. Um, uh, honestly, I don't, sometimes I scratch my head that, uh, again, I got 20 something Sonodcons under my belt. I think the Synergy horn is the most significant thing that's been done in loudspeakers in a long time. And yet um, the the proliferation of, of, of this vertical stack, uh, uh, you know, fascination has, and, and honestly, uh, dirt cheap DSP, um, uh, extremely cheap processing has 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 enabled some really hideous designs to get promoted.
because they say, hey, we can fix it with the processing. And Claiborne has his slide rule. Oh, I got to turn my camera on because I could I could literally <laughs> pull mine. It's in my, I have my slide rule, my Synodicon slide rule, and I have my V. <laughs> There's an old soul. And Todd's got one too. <laughs> Those old slide rules. Yeah, the, uh, I like uh, how Claiborne mentions it. Uh, he shows it to his computer science students, you know, because that that was the computer back uh, back in the day before uh, desktop computers were were even a thing. <laughs> Didn't have to wait for a dang boot up. There's no, uh, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's no. Um, the, the concept of Windows was you had to look in the right box. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, open the right drawer and get it out. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying, you know, when you looked at the, when you slid, the, when you slide the ruler, make sure you're looking in the right box to get the right answer. And, and you know, there it was. And, uh, man, oh, right. uh, and I had an uncle who was a br brilliant mathematician who could fly through a conventional slide rule. I mean, he could get answers as fast as some people could do with a computer. Wow. So Ryan was asking about the uh, OEM for the uh, for the uh, the amplifier that's in the um, studio, studio too. too. Um, that if you want to talk uh, about that for a minute, because there's I know you know there's some other unique things that uh, people will get to see in the future from yep. from that whole thing, but uh, um, but it's a little bit of a departure from what we've done in the past. That's right. Um, I can say without getting into the specifics of the o of the specific OEM, um, uh, I mean, a lot of y'all know we're using Linea for um, for our amplifiers, and I think Linea makes just an amazing amp. They're going through um, uh, some uh, uh, new processes, and uh, uh, our intention would be <clears throat> to use them for uh, as much as possible, all of it. Um, uh, so uh, I'll leave it at that. But but we, uh, for those that wonder, well, why doesn't Danley do more with um, um, FIR and this kind of thing? Um, uh, just know that there are some uh, convolution engines available now that uh, allow us to dial some stuff in. Uh, and if you if you've heard uh, a Studio Two. Um, you will understand just how dialed in we can get a box. Right. I, I remember the uh, first time, and it wasn't that terribly long ago, I got to actually sit down and listen to a Studio 2 in a, in a, a decent environment. And, uh, wow, uh, that is something that everyone should experience. Uh, you know, it's amazing when you can listen to a quality recording. Uh, being played back on quality loudspeakers that do a really good job with imaging. Um, it's, it blows me away every single time. And that's just one of those things that is so difficult to find these days because, uh, you know, in the consumer industry, it seems everything's driven so strongly by price that everything's as inexpensive as it can possibly be. And in the pro market, everything is driven by how much DSP and FIR and, how many, you know, um, how much lingo can I throw at it to make it, quote, better, you know, and is it really better, you know? Yeah, and I used you... the old, years ago, I used the analogy of, of of water purification, you know, I mean, if you've ever, you can certainly take uh, salt water and a lot of stuff that's, you know, would be toxic and run it through enough processes uh reverse osmosis and various filtrations and and ultimately you can make it where it's it's potable but yet if you've ever drank water right out of the side of the uh, out of a north georgia mountain out of a pure spring uh that that heavily treated water never tastes like like nature's true pure water right yeah. and, the, and 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 it's kind of like i feel like that way with a lot of loudspeakers i listen to them and go well it's well, okay, it's sort of almost there, but it's not something that inspires me. It's not something that I go, wow, I couldn't live without that. And I'm like you, I during this uh, uh, shelter in place, we've been fortunate to 
some of us have worked every day. And um, uh, one of the things that I did more than a few times was I sit back in one of the warehouses and would listen to a stereo pair of, of Studio 8s and just get lost, man. A Studio 8, Studio 2s. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, hold on there. Have, You're gonna, everybody we don't really have Studio excited. 8 yet. <laughs> what the heck's that? How far ahead of the curve is he exactly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, very good. I think the questions have pretty well slowed down here. Oh, Ian needs uh, studio weight pricing. If you can get that yeah. over to him right yeah, away. Right. Yeah. Be right on that, brother. <laughs> he's he's probably got a you know a dozen of them sold already since you mentioned it a minute ago. So uh... <laughs> he's got my only sample. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, well cool. Y'all very much. Yeah, that, that pretty well wraps up this week's fireside chat. Thank you very much, Mike, for for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, always a pleasure to have you and and to chat with you, uh, especially when we can talk about things as as fun as uh, the history of things that we've done in the past and and how that's guiding where we're going in the future and and uh, that kind of thing. So it's it's a lot of fun. Um, but I want to remind everyone to be sure to check out the Danley Sound Labs YouTube channel to see all the episodes of the Fireside Chats. Uh, we try to get them up, you know, as quick as we can, but they're usually about a week behind because um, it just it takes time. You know, everybody's got a limited amount of that. So, so we try to get them up. But uh, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you coming and we'll talk to you again. Thanks, Josh. See you, buddy. All right. See you.